This is visual acuity in refraction and refractive error for B551 refraction. Visual acuity has a rule. The rule or criteria for determining if somebody can read a, a series of letters or what their acuity is, is they need to be able to read more than half the letters on a line. But why do we have that as a rule? We could have a rule that they have to read all the letters on a line or exactly half or 75%. Why is it more than half? Well, let's assume we're using a traditional Snellen chart with five letters on a line. That means a patient needs to be able to read three letters correctly to see that line, three being more than half of five. In a traditional Snellen chart, that means there are nine letters, C, D, E, F, L, O, P, T, Z. What's the probability of reading three letters correctly by random chance? Well, that's nine times nine times nine, or 729. So there's a 1 in 729 chance of guessing three letters correctly out of a five-letter choice. So it's statistically very unlikely if the person can read three letters, they probably can read the whole line. And that's why we consider that the rule for visual acuity. But let's take a look at what the patient's actually seeing while they're doing this task. These are examples of what happens to the, the retinal image, the blur of the image, as it goes through the eye. We have two different, three different examples here. One image has no blur, the other one has two diopters of blur, and the third has four diopters of blur. What we can see is that the letters start changing in their resolution or their ability to see them as the amount of blur is in increased is induced. But what's the patient see as they approach their threshold? Well, here we have two diopters of blur, and we have a series of letters, R, Z, V, D, E, and D, H, E, V, P. What if we just ask the patient if they can read the line? Well, they might look at this Z here and it's definitely a Z, so I can easily see that I'd say a Z. Conversely, they see this letter down here in the, the bottom circle and they see D or maybe it's a G or maybe it's an O, so they're randomly guessing and they feel different levels of confidence in it. So if we actually just subjectively ask the patient, can they see it? They may choose that to decide they can or cannot see it subjectively rather than actually reading the letters in which they may or may not have guessed correctly. The point of this is to always make sure the patient reads the letters. Do not let them say subjectively, do they see it or not? And this is because patients come in with different criteria. Some patients might come in and say, these are really easy or I'm, I'm really a gambler. I feel like I can read these off and so I'll guess without any reserve, and I'll try and guess all these letters. Other people might come in with a different th threshold or a criteria where they're more reserved and they don't want to be wrong. And so they won't say, the, say that they can see it when they actually can. So that's why we can't just ask subjectively whether they see the letters. We have to actually ask them to read it. It violates the principles of the test if you don't have them read the letters and just ask if they see it or not. But what's happening at the retinal level? Well, in visual space, we can have a spot that's being projected onto the retina. It creates what's called a point spread function, which isn't all that crit critical to know at this point. And we have two spots now spaced out in real space, visual space. Now, those two spots create a point spread function on the retina, and we perceive that. Now, how far apart those are and how big those spots are, it determines whether they're resolvable or not as far as letters go. Let's think about that on the retinal level. Here's our cone photoreceptor mosaic. This is a, a on phosphor on the face or looking straight at the back of the retina's cone receptors. All these little spots are a different cone, whether it's a red cone or a blue cone or a, or a green cone, they're all there. Well, let's take a closer look. And this is again from Steve Burns's lab here at IUSO. Let's say we have two spots on the retina. One's not resolvable and the other ones are resolvable. In the top image, we have two spots they're now overlapping. And with those two spots, because the spots are so large, they're projecting onto multiple cones at the same time. And so they're no longer resolvable as far as the actual spot itself. Conversely, if we look at the lower image where the spots resolve individually on each cone, we can resolve those spots equally. But what about in refractive error? Why, why does this matter as far as our visual acuity in refractive error? Because it's the same size, same thing. It's the size of the retinal image on the retina created by the blur. So we've got three examples here. We've got an emetrope at the top where the image is focused perfectly onto the, onto the retina. And then we have the middle one, we have a myope. 
and that myopes image is focused in front of the retina. But that light doesn't just stop where it's focused at, it projects back behind it to the retina. In an emetrope versus a myope, the retinal blur size, the size of the circle on the back of the eye are different. The myope has a much larger blur circle. So when it tries to resolve that letter E, it's too big to resolve that letter E, whereas an emetrope has enough small enough retinal spot sizes to resolve that E. Now, that's how also how a pinhole works, right? Is we put install a pinhole, it reduces the peripheral rays and reduces the blur size. Even though it's still focused in front of the retina, the total retinal blur size is now reduced. And then once we have those, the retinal blur spots now can be small enough to resolve that E again. So how does this affect visual acuity on each type of patient? This is an example was called a through focus experiment or a through focus for an emetrope without accommodation. All it is is simply clicking through like a dumb person, one lens at a time, asking the person what they see, taking measuring their acuity. Here we went from plus five to minus five in a half diopter steps. In the real life, you would never do this because it would take forever and be a giant waste of time. But what happens as we do this in, a, in an emetrope without accommodation? Well, as we add plus, as we add from high plus to, to emetropia, the resolution of the images start to decrease. And that's what I've blown up down here for you as we reach one and a half diopters and we start to look at the 2020, 2015 lines, we start to be able to see those lines become resolvable or visually you can see them. Now, again, this is without accommodation, which is the critical component we're showing here. This provides a, a perfect endpoint at zero diopters where everything's at its clearest at zero diopters and anything plus or minus around that is blurry. And so the patient will not be able to resolve those letters and then actually measure their refraction properly. Let's take a look though in the condition, that same emetrope with accommodation. In this situation, we're still going from plus five to minus five and half diopter steps. And as we approach emetropia, the resolution starts to max, to reach its maximum. It's all its clearest at 0, 0.0 diopters. Now what happens if we push past that with more minus? As we add more minus and half diopter steps, it's equally resolvable. The acuity is still 20-20. It doesn't matter if you have zero diopters of, of prescription in there, minus a half, minus one, minus 150. You can even go to two, 250, and sometimes even higher, depending on how much accommodation the patient has. And so accommodation by itself can, can make your endpoint very difficult to find if you don't control it properly. And that's what refraction, the technique, is to control accommodation is a critical component of it. But this illustrates with accommodation, people, as you add minus, still remain relatively clear and can still resolve a 2020 or a 2015 line. Now let's look at myopes. The only difference between a myope and an emetrope with and without accommodation is that their, their point of focus, of optimal focus has been shifted, in this case, two diopters. So without accommodation, it's just like the condition with emetropes, where they have a fine endpoint of minus two diopters, and anything plus or minus around that, more or less minus around that, makes the image less clear or blurry. However, though, with accommodation, because younger people have accommodation, as we add more minus past the minus two diopters, the image no longer the image stays relatively clear all the way through, just like before. Let's now look at hyperopes, same situation as the myopes. In this case, we have a two diopter hyperope with accommodation and without accommodation. At the top is without accommodation. This patient's gonna come in and see both blurry at distance and near. We always think of hyperopia as having problems at near, but once you have no accommodation, it affects distance and near at the same time. So this patient's gonna see poorly at distance, 2080, and at near, they're gonna see 2200 because they have even more need for more plus and they can't see. So their vision at near is worse than their distance, but they still can't see well at distance either without glasses. Now let's look at a hyperope with accommodation. If they have enough accommodation, it doesn't matter where you're at, distance or near, they ask, they're gonna see 2020 at all distances. And that's because, as we've been pointing out repeatedly, Accommodation. Accommodation is the process by which the lens adds plus to allow us to see up close. 
In the unaccommodated eye of a hyperope, the image is focused behind the retina. But once they start accommodating, even for distance, they can actually correct that and bring the image onto the retina, thereby keeping the vision clear and focused. So this is what we try and seek all the time in our subjective refractions, something called the MPMVA, or maximum plus to maximum visual acuity. What that is, is the lens with the most plus that still provides the best visual acuity. Now there's lots of lenses that will provide equal acuity, as we've pointed out, both for myopes, emetropes, and hyperopes, if you have accommodation. If you don't have accommodation, it's a very easy endpoint to find, which is just the peak of the function. But the MPMVA is the lens that provides the best vision with the most plus. Now, their best vision might be 2020, it might be 2015, it might be 2040, it depends on the person's retina and their overall ocular health. But you want to find the best lens that has the most plus is the endpoint in subjective refraction. The end. Thank you.